Muchas gracias uh, y buenas tardes. Uh, so, I'm delighted to, to come to San Diego and to uh, talk to you this afternoon about volcanoes, but in particular, I'm going to look at uncertainty and how we have to harness that when we want to protect populations from volcanic eruptions. To begin with, I'll just tell you that uh, I studied in Chile for my PhD many years ago in two places, in, in Lascar Volcano in the north and in, uh, at Lonquimay near Temuco. Uh, so it's very nice for me to come back here. The eruption of Krakatau in 1883 is one of the, the eruptions that we all know well about. It was a very violent eruption and it generated terrible tsunami that claimed 36,000 lives. And you see uh, a drawing of the eruption on the left. On the right is a, a, a picture from a scientific paper published just a few years ago showing a computer simulation of a tsunami from Krakatau. And the colors show the, the height of the waves as they reach the shoreline of Java and Sumatra. And this paper almost exactly prefigures what happened last month just before Christmas when several hundred people were killed by tsunamis from a collapse of the volcano. And this shows that the science is not enough to protect people. We have to do more than that. This is uh, a photograph taken uh, from the showing the destruction by the tsunami last month. Another of the very deadly phenomena that we, we encounter on volcanoes is known as pyroclastic flows. And you see a pyroclastic flow here in Japan in 1991, generated from the collapse of the lava dome at the summit of the volcano. And it's rushing down the valley. It has large blocks in it. It's at a temperature of several hundred degrees. And uh, 40 people were killed uh, in the path of this uh, phenomenon. And it was pyroclastic flows that destroyed this village in Guatemala also last year in June. Again, many hundreds of people perished. This volcano had been active frequently over the last decades. It was a well-studied well volcano. There had been plenty of monitoring, and yet still a tragedy happens. How do we do better? And in particular, something to perhaps think about. Imagine that you're the director of a volcano observatory, and the volcano that you're responsible for starts rumbling. How would you decide when it's time to call for an evacuation of tens of thousands of people, or perhaps hundreds of thousands of people? What evidence can we use to reach that kind of a decision? The man on the right is someone who did have to make those kinds of decisions, in Indonesia, and we'll come to uh, his contribution a little bit later in the talk. One of the problems that we have in managing volcanic risks is the science only gets us so far. We can characterize the volcanic hazards, and there are many kinds. We've seen pyroclastic flow, tsunami. Of course, ash clouds can affect aviation. They can also disrupt agriculture when the ash falls to the ground. So this is already a complexity. Volcanoes don't only do one thing. They can present many hazards. We can characterize them. We can monitor volcanoes. But how do we harness that information to inform decision makers who maybe have to make that, that big call? Do we evacuate a city of several tens or hundreds of thousands of people? And in between the science and the decision making, we have society. And societies vary from one place to another. Some societies are more tolerant of risks than others. We need to be able to communicate effectively to societies to enable them to understand risks and be able to act appropriately when the authorities, when the scientists think it's time for action. The gap between the left panel and the right panel is sometimes called the risk management gap. And we have to bridge that, find ways to bridge that when we're thinking of uh, risk management. Another kind of uncertainty that we have when we try to reach decisions is we have incomplete knowledge of volcanoes. 
This is uh, the eruption of Chaiten in southern Chile in 2008. This volcano was not on our scientific radar at all. No one had considered that this might be a potentially active volcano. It hadn't erupted in human history. It wasn't seen as a priority for monitoring. And yet it was responsible for one of the largest eruptions in the last decades. This kind of uncertainty I call epistemic uncertainty. It's uncertainty that we can reduce by new studies, by monitoring, by gaining information. Another kind of uncertainty that we call aleatory uncertainty expresses the randomness of many natural phenomena. I'm showing here uh, some erupting lava at a volcano in Vanuatu. You can imagine that to understand these processes, to be able to model the physics of the flow of molten rock here, which has the three phases of matter. It has crystals, it has a liquid, and it has gas bubbles. There is so much uh, randomness to volcanic processes. And this kind of uncertainty, we cannot reduce, but we have to somehow account for it when we want to assess risks. And one way we can harness it is to make probabilistic assessments rather than deterministic ones. Here's a volcano in Guadeloupe, which came to life in 1976, and it illustrates another problem in volcanology. This volcano started rumbling. The seismic mon monitors picked up earth earthquakes. There were some small explosions at the summit, and the authorities called for the evacuation of 80,000 people. That's a huge disruption on people's lives and livelihoods. They're, they're no longer participating in the economy. In the end, there wasn't a big eruption. There were huge recriminations in, in France between scientists and the authorities, and this had a very damaging impact on the economy. The problem is, worldwide, perhaps only 10 to 20 percent of the cases of unrest of volcanoes that we monitor and observe culminate in an eruption. How do we decide whether our rumbling volcano is really going to do it this time? This graph is illustrating earthquake data collected on the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean. This volcano came to life in 1995 for the first time in recorded history. And even to this day, it is exhibiting unrest. The volcano is still deforming. And in the green and red uh, pink panels here, you see phases of activity of the volcano. In pink, you see phases when the volcano was actually erupting. Lava was being extruded at the summit of the volcano. It produced pyroclastic flows, mud flows, many hazardous phenomena. But then it stopped. And then it started again, and then it stopped, and then it started again. This is a very difficult situation for risk management, not least because on that kind of a time scale, there are many changes in the political authorities. On Montserrat, the governor changed, the UK government changed, the government of Montserrat changed. This kind of time scale is very difficult to generate a consistent policy over. And as we saw in the case of Montserrat, and in many other volcanoes, catastrophe often strikes after the population has become inured to the risk, once people have become complacent. Imagine having to live in an evacuation center or in a church or in a mosque. Uh, while you see that your, your home, your land is still intact, the volcano is rumbling. And what, what is shown on this graph is the number of fatalities from volcanic eruptions from the last century or so plotted against the time from the onset of the eruption to when the fatalities occurred. You see very early on, in, in, in time scales of hours, there is a big peak in fatalities, and that represents volcanoes that came to life very suddenly. There wasn't enough warning to get people out of harm's way. But you can see even bigger peaks in the curve where the deadly phase of the eruption has happened months or even years after the eruption started. This is because people have gone back to their territories and then they've been hit by a major event. What can we do about this? How do we harness uncertainty in volcanic risk management? One of the first things we can do is to study the geology of a volcano. This is a sequence 
of pumice and ash on El Teide volcano in Tenerife, in the Canary Islands. Geologists can interpret these deposits, date the deposits, and identify larger and smaller eruptions that have happened in the past. That can guide us to think about future scenarios that could play out on the volcano. With those kinds of data, we can run computational models based on our understanding of the physics of volcanic processes. The example shown here is for the volcano Vesuvio in Italy, near Napoli. And the scenario used in the model is of the last large eruption of Vesuvio, which occurred in 1631. And you can see in this wonderful picture, it even shows the pyroclastic flows reaching the coast. Several thousand people were killed during this eruption. From studying the deposits, we can work out the size of the pumice and ash particles. We can then run a model that we pump this ash and pumice up into the atmosphere as if it were a volcanic eruption, and then let a simulated wind field carry that ash through the atmosphere. And that's why there's some mathematics there. That's the process of, of diffusion of particles through the atmosphere. We can run the model, and the model will simulate where will the ash fall out on the ground. We've got a hazard model now. We can convert that to a risk model by thinking about how much ash do we need to accumulate on the roofs of buildings to cause structural damage. So this is a way from taking geology and understanding of the physics of volcanic processes and testing a scenario of what could happen in the future. We can also, of course, monitor volcanoes. Uh, this is my favorite volcano in Antarctica, Mount Erebus, where I spent 13 of the austral summers. And you can see an array of our monitoring equipment. Just yesterday, I was at the uh, observatory of the Southern Andes and visited this extraordinarily wonderful facility in, in Temuco. They're monitoring all the volcanoes of Chile. And as you know, that's a lot of volcanoes at this nerve center. And all of those screens, these are all computer screens with live monitoring data, seismic data, gas emissions, the changing shape of the volcano. This is part of the short-term monitoring and hazard assessment that is carried out and is, is vital if we want to detect the signs that a volcano is coming back to life and if it's becoming more threatening. I wanted to give you an example of how monitoring data are actually used. And if you remember the Indonesian man I showed you at the beginning, Serono is his name. Uh, this was the crisis that he was responsible for, the eruption of Merapi in 2010. Merapi is a very densely populated volcano. You see in that nighttime photograph just how urbanized it is around the volcano. And the timeline that I'll show you on the left is showing a number of monitoring parameters, all earthquake data, but of different kinds of uh, individual earthquakes. And we're going to scroll through time. We're currently in uh, the beginning of September of 2010. And you can see that by mid-September, the seismic activity is building up. So the scientists are already taking a look at this, but the volcano has been at level one of alert up until now. That's the lowest level of alert of the, the volcano. But things pick up some more, and they raise the alert level to number two. They pick up even more, and now you can see that the trend of seismicity is almost becoming exponential. Now the scientists are getting very concerned about what this volcano is building up towards, and they've gone to level three, which means that, that an eruption is very likely. And at this point, they evacuated a zone of a radius 10 kilometers around the summit. Unfortunately, not everybody got out, or some refused to leave. Around 40 were killed uh, in, in this village. We go further in time, and the shaded region in the graph is showing a new type of seismic signal called tremor. The volcano is, is rumbling continuously. This is a very important sign for volcanologists because it suggests that the, the molten rock is traveling up towards the surface. And the 
evacuation zone was extended to 15 kilometers. And then, as things really picked up, it was extended to 20 kilometers. Not quite in time, 360 people were caught out. But as a result of the evacuations, some 10 to 20,000 lives were saved. And they were saved thanks to the monitoring and thanks to its application in alerting the citizens and moving them out of the way. Some 400,000 people evacuated from this region. But the science only takes us so far, as I said earlier. We have to be able to communicate our understanding of volcanoes as well as our uncertainty about volcanism and our uncertainty in interpreting the monitoring data. We have to be able to communicate that to the population. Uh, these slides show some of the efforts around the volcanoes uh, of the Southern Andes. And you can see the efforts of the Chilean scientists to go into the communities, to meet teachers, to explain to children, to explain to the guides on Villarica what volcanoes can do, as well as the uncertainties that we have as scientists. We're not always going to get it right. And I'd like to end with, with this quote from the social scientist Ulrich Beck. When we're faced with, with major risks, we can make two kinds of assertion, two choices. We can either be paralyzed with fear about the risks, or we can see these risks as giving us new room for action. Thank you very much. Thank you.